Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a joy to be able to say this morning with you all that it is well with our souls. And I'm so very thankful to be with you this morning. I realize that probably a lot of you maybe do not know who exactly that I am, but my name is Adrian Judd, and I do claim Alan as my dad and Laura as my grandma, if you know who they are. But most importantly, I claim our God as my God, and I'm thankful that we can worship Him and learn more about Him this morning. Amen. One of the most frightening things that can happen to us as individuals is being lost. Now, I didn't want to admit this to you all this morning, but I kind of had this experience this morning as I was coming here. As it turns out, um, I live in Crossville, Tennessee, and usually the path that I would take to get here would be I-40. And I-40 this morning, there was some kind of accident. I had to turn off. I had to go a different way this morning, so I was feeling a little bit lost. But then when I came and I turned into the parking lot, I felt even a little bit more lost because although Brother Johnny told me Bible class started at 10 o'clock, I arrived here at 9 o'clock. And so I was feeling a little bit lost this morning. Thankfully, uh, I decided to come back. I didn't decide to leave. Um, but I was feeling a little bit lost even this morning. But being lost, being lost is scary. And it's something that hopefully maybe you've not had a lot of experiences of in your life. But I'm sure if we all went around the room this morning, you could share a story of a time that you were lost or maybe your child was lost, or maybe one of your grandchildren or nephews or nieces, maybe they were lost. And it's terrifying, right? Because when we lose something, it, it's almost, we realize how much important it is to our lives. If you've ever lost a phone or a wallet or a keys, I don't know about you, but that's not exactly how I'd like to start my day when I'm trying to go to work or I'm trying to get something done. That's can completely derail your day. But amazingly, we serve a God who really has never lost. He has everything in the entire world. But the question that I want us to ask ourselves this morning is, how does God view the lost? And maybe and adjacent to that, how does he view loss? So this morning, we're going to look at several um, ways, maybe, that come to mind in the world, or come to the mind of some Christians of how God views the loss. We're not immediately going to turn to Luke 15, although that is where we are headed. But we're going to look at some of the ways that some people think that God views the loss. So this morning, if you want, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1 this morning. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, how does God view the loss? And does he view the loss as, does he really care? Is God unconcerned about the loss this morning? Before you dismiss that idea, turn to Genesis chapter 1 and chapters 1 and 2. We're not going to read any specific verses here, but I want you to imagine with me that you go into work maybe tomorrow, or you go into school, and maybe there's the co-worker that comes up to you and they say, like, hey, I know that you went to church yesterday, like, and I don't really, really understand that because in my view of things, um, maybe there is a God. Like, I'm, I'm really not sure that there is, but if there is a God, uh, like you said, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, like, God created the world. He designed it um, with his power, but God really doesn't care anymore. God doesn't really care about what I do, what I say. Like, God just, as it were, he wound up this clock, right? And he said over, and who knows if he's going to ever come back into the picture or not. And all that few, all that people see is Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and it's like, well, he gave, said to have dominion over the earth, right? In chapter 1 and verses 26 and following, after he makes, makes man, he says, you are free to do it with that as you will. Now, that is the opinion of some people in the world that you might encounter. And if God is unconcerned and such, maybe they could take it a step further. Like, well, 
if he is concerned, all that God is really concerned about for me is that God wants me to be happy. You've heard that about before, right? You've heard God, you know, if he, if he cares, right? Which, if he cares, he just wants me to be happy. Like, if you turn to James chapter 1 and verse number 17, it says that God is the abundant God. God showers us down with blessings. He's the one whom all blessings come. God is like, in a way, this grandpa in the sky. And he just wants me to be happy. He wants me to do whatever I can do. And further, going to Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 1, Jesus says, do not judge. You can't judge me for my view of God. He says, judge not that you be not judged. So Christian, like, if God cares, which, again, is a big if, but he cares, one, all he wants is my best. Like, he just wants me to be happy. He wants me to be loved. And he doesn't want you getting in the way of that for me. God doesn't really care. He just wants me to be happy. That's one view in the world that people, of how people think that God views the loss. Now, we're going to come back to that later, but just keep that in mind. We'll address some of the fallacies of that later. The second view, which maybe has gotten you thinking before about how God views the loss, is maybe God is sad at the loss. Maybe he looks down and he, he set these rules, right? And he set these commandments. And if you turn in Genesis chapter 6, um, you will see this language that God is sad at the loss. Now, this makes sense to us, right? If I lose something, right, usually I'm going to be kind of concerned about it, right? I mean, I hope when I we get done with worship this morning, I hope I don't go out in the parking lot. I'm like, where did my car go? Like, I'm not going to be, I'm going to want my car to be there. I'm not going to be too unconcerned about that. But if my car is gone, Maybe um, there's going to be some frustration there, uh, which we'll get into later. But, I mean, I'm going to be kind of sad. I mean, I, I love you guys, um, but I don't know how many of you would drive me back across hole or be able to find my car enough time to do that, right? Like, I'm going to be kind of sad about that. Um, but this view of God, right, that people have, maybe God created people and he wanted them to be good and he wanted them to do the right things. But maybe when they don't do that, all he is is sad. Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 and 6 read like this. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now pause for a minute. The only thing that people were thinking about was evil, that they were wicked, that they had turned from the good God who had given them everything. That's enough to be sad about. In verse number 6, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. God sat here. Now that's something that we read about in the Bible, that God is sad over people when they choose to do differently than what he has asked them to do. Well, you may say, Adrian, we've talked about this in the Old Testament. That's really interesting, but let's, what about the New Testament such? Well, go to Mark chapter 10, and you will find a familiar story that's found in several of the gospel accounts. And you will, you will find here a man who's called the rich young ruler. Now, this is a guy who could be very similar to me and you today. This guy comes to Jesus, and he calls him a good teacher. So he acknowledges Jesus has something good to say. Jesus knows a little bit about what must I do to inherit eternal life. Verse number 17, that's what he asked him. And then Jesus gives him the response. Have you kept the commandments? The commandments that Moses gave, he quotes several of the Ten Commandments. And then the rich young ruler says, I have done that. I have kept those commandments. Look at verse number 21. And I can't help um, to see how much Jesus cares about people, and especially about this young man in this passage. It says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, 
follow me. Jesus is extending this invitation to this young man that he could be a disciple with Christ. He could be a follower. But verse number 22, disheartened by the saying, he, the rich young ruler, went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus says, how difficult, in verse number 23, is it? Will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Now, we don't know what kind of tone of voice explicitly that Jesus said that to his apostles and the ones who were near. But I can't help but think that reading earlier about Jesus loving this man, that Jesus has to have some kind of sorrow over this young man. So is God, though, just sorry when people sin, but he's not really having any consequences? Now, this may be akin to the idea of you thinking about if you have a football team or a basketball team or something like that, you know, um, they lose sometimes. They win sometimes. But at the end of the day, whether they win or lose, whichever makes you happy or sad, you're still going to be a fan of them. You're still going to be rooting for them. So is that how God views us? That when we mess up, well, it's okay. Like, I'm sad about it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I think you can see that there's a little bit more to it than that. But the third view is, does God, when people sin, when there are lost people in the world, is God angry at the lost? Look back in Genesis chapter 6, and I intentionally uh, skipped over this earlier to make our point, but if you look in the very next verse in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 7, we all know um, the story of the flood. We all know what's going to happen. Not only was God sad and upset, but in verse number 7, it says, And the Lord said, I will blot out man, whom I created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Not only was God upset and saddened, but he says, I'm not only going to do that, but I am going to enforce consequences. I am going to wipe these people out through a earth flood. Now, this is a story that's very familiar to us. We hear it all the time at Vacation Bible School, and it's really cute because like, as children, we have these toy arcs, you know, and we have the little animals. But I'm just going to tell you guys, like, if you were there with Noah in this time and you were not on the ark, like, that's it's the most terrifying thing you could imagine. And I don't want to play upon the moment too much, but we all know what's happened in the past few weeks with all the flooding that's happened in North Carolina and in the east part of our state. Like, magnify that throughout the entire earth like that's what's going on like it's not it's not good it's very very scary and that's what happens in the story of the flood god who we know who god is right he was so grieved by his people that he said the only way that we can make this right is by starting all over again that had to be some great wickedness indeed but is god angry just angry at his people if you go on throughout the, further throughout the text of the Bible, uh, we see God getting angry. In Exodus, um, we see the ten plagues that are very common, that are familiar to us. But you remember in Exodus chapter 11, what the final plague in Egypt was, right? Let's read Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 through 10. Now it says, so Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every, every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been or ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. And then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you. 
that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, the, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of the land. Now this again, for us, we think about this story as being thousands, and of course we're right, and hundreds of years ago. Can you imagine that every, every firstborn, and he says, from the king supreme to the lowliest of servant girls, every single firstborn child is gone and is not wiped out. Now bear in mind at this time, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. They thought, we've got the pyramids, right? That, that's historically what's going on at this time period. They were vastly far ahead of all the nations of the earth. And God says, you worship all these foreign gods, all these false deities, and you mistreat my people of Israel. But I'm going to show you who I am. And he gave them a chance, right? He said to Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh hardened his heart and allowed God to harden his heart to the point that every firstborn in Egypt died. God was angry to the point that he allowed and made this happen. So is God just angry at the loss? And if you look, go even further, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, in verse number 3, God says when the people of Israel have come out of Egypt, when they're about to go into the land of promise, he says, go and wipe out all these peoples, all of these nations before you. Do not leave any of them behind. And one final example that we can read from is in 1 Samuel chapter 15, which is a little bit further along in um, the story of the people of Israel. But God, again, makes a very bold claim. It's like, is this really what God said? Is this really what he wants? But in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and Samuel said, The Lord sent me to anoint the king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. This is God speaking. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. What? Samuel is telling Saul, wipe them out. Everything, everything that has breath, air, wipe it all out. That's what God said. Is God just angry at people who are lost? I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to address these concerns that we've raised. We have seen and we have asked ourselves the question, is God unconcerned about the lost? Is God just sad about the loss? And is God just angry about the loss? But what we are going to find in Luke chapter 15, and when we go back and look at these passages and stories, is that the way that God views the lost is that he wants them to be found. And we see this very powerfully illustrated in Luke chapter 15. And there are some hard questions that we're going to try to answer with all these other points of view. But in Luke 15, this is Jesus speaking, right? And he is our ultimate guide. He is the one whom we put our trust. And he is the one who shows us how much God really and truly does care. So in Luke chapter 15, um, it is one of the more familiar passages in the Bible. We have the story of the lost sheep, and we have the story of the lost coin, and we have the story of the lost boys. All of that parable has been called multiple different things, and for good reason. But in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, we have to realize who Jesus is talking to in this instance. And it says in the start of verse number 1, tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear Jesus. So in these people's time and such, these would be the people who are lost. Um, very much overtly so. But in verse number 2, it also says, The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. As we will see, these people who thought that they were found by God really might have been the people who were most 
loss to begin with. But the first story, we find the way that God used loss and wanting them to be found, that God is not indifferent. He cares about the loss. In Luke 15, verse number 4, the beginning of this parable, Jesus asked, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, for us, I, I don't know how many of you have sheep or if any of you have sheep at all. Um, but in this day, 200 sheep would be about the average that a shepherd would actually have. So this person who has 100 sheep, they're actually somewhat considered to be poor in a way. And Jesus is asking them, like he would ask us, just because you have 99 that are in the barn, that are safe, are you just going to leave the other one out there? I mean, in that day, again, this is these people's livelihood. This is something that would have been very valuable to them. And the spiritual, of course, application for us is, is that even though, right, this morning, even though there may be 99% of people at Holiday who are at Holiday Church of Christ who are worshiping this morning, who have obeyed God, even the, if they are saved, if there is even 1% who is lost, God cares about that person. And God is the one who wants to find them, who wants to seek them out. In the story of the lost coin, in Luke chapter 15, verse number 8, it says, What woman, having ten coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? You see, there's something about incompletion, right, um, that bothers us, and it should bother us, right? When we are not have all that we're supposed to have, when not every one of us is saved or is doing well, like, we hurt for that people. The reason that we talk about the sick, right, uh, in church is, I mean, probably some of us, most of us, are in good health. And that's awesome. That's good. But we hurt, and we want to bear the burdens of those people who are not <laughs> feeling well. We're not just going to leave them out because they're not feeling well. And what Jesus is illustrating in these passages and this story is those who are lost, even if it's just one person, God cares about that person. God wants that person to be found again. God cares about the lost. And in addressing the issue of does God just want me to be happy? Does God just want me to do what I want to do? Uh, I think that will become more clear the more that we talk about God wanting the lost to be found in these other points. The second point, though, in addressing this issue, we talked about how God is sad at the lost. But realize that God is not just sad about it. He's not just going to not enforce any consequences or do nothing about it. He's not just going to sit on his hands and be like, man, I really wish they would come. God is going to seek the loss. We read it about it already in the story, but notice in verse number four that this shepherd had to go into the open country. The shepherd had to leave his other 99 sheep and go on a journey, which for us is only a few lines in the story, but this could have taken minutes and hours and maybe even days to be able to find that sheep. The woman in this story, she has to light a lamp and sweep the house. Now, who knows how big her house was, how much time that took, but that took effort to be able to seek that lost coin. And just ask yourself this morning, if you feel that God does not care about me, like maybe God cares about that person or this person, but like Adrian, how does God care about me this morning? I want you to just ask yourself the question. If people who care about material things enough will take minutes and hours and days out of their time to find something that is lost, how much more so does the God of the universe, who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who is all-caring, how much more does he care? Is he going to try to seek after you? God cares about you. God wants you. And he is going to seek you. Now, in this story, in Luke chapter 15, in the first two stories, we find 
that the people are actively trying to find something that is lost. Now what's interesting is the parable of the lost son is that he is allowed, the younger brother, is allowed to go into the open country to be able to make his own decisions and to do whatever he wants. And the father lets him. God is going to allow you this morning and throughout your entire life to make a choice. And he wants you to choose to follow him, to serve him, to seek other people who are lost. But some, he's going to allow you, if you want, to go into the open country. He's going to allow you to choose, if you want to be, to be lost. But notice that he cares. And the way that the father receives the son, in Luke 15, verse number 20, and he, talking about the younger son, arose. When he realized, I messed up. I need to go back to my father. At the very least, I can be a servant and be, have enough bread to just live. He arose and came to his father. But while he, the younger son, was still a long way off, verse number 20, his father saw him. The father was not just idly waiting. The father was looking to try to receive the son. He saw him and he runs to him. He felt compassion for him. He embraced his son and he kissed him. Now, you probably maybe have heard it before, but in the Jewish day in the world of their culture, men do not run. They just don't do it. My dad likes to run, um, but he would not have made a very good Jew because Jews do not put men, Jews in public do not run. It's just not done. But this man, who, who his son has done who knows what in this open country, who would have probably in their town, man, did you see like what that son did, like how he left his father, how he disgraced his family? What does the father do? Does he care about what those other people are saying, what those other people are thinking? He runs to the son, and he embraces him, and he kisses him, and he welcomes him back as a son of his. He welcomes him back to the family, and that's what God wants to do for us. He's not just sad about it, but he wants to pursue us. He wants us to actively know him. And he is ready for us to be joyously found. I just want to, um, I, we've asked the question about how God needs the lost this morning. But also, I just want you to think about, um, as we read verses 7 and 10, how does heaven welcome the lost? Or how does, when they are found again, right? How does that impact their environment? In Luke 15, verse number 7, it says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one who's sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Verse number 10, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I don't want to um, accuse anyone, uh, anyone this morning, but I just want us to humbly reflect and ask ourselves the question, when I see someone who is lost, right, and I'm not the judge of the universe, um, and I don't know what's in people's hearts, I don't know what their relationship with God is, but what is my reaction when I encounter that person? Is my, my immediate reaction to be like, man, there's no telling what those people do on Saturday night. Or, man, there's no telling what those people are doing like on Sunday morning. Like, I mean, I'm just so glad that like, I know Jesus. And like, again, is that our reaction to people who don't know Christ? The people who have never been embraced by the Father? Or who maybe... They're in another building this morning, right? And they're singing songs to God, maybe with some other accompaniment. Or maybe they're leading some prayers or readings, but maybe there are some females who are taking in that. Or maybe there are some preachers this morning in those buildings who are you know, talking about all kinds of things. What is our reaction to people who do not know, who do not understand the truth, of what God's word says. I hope this morning that our reaction to reading this story, to realizing the lost, look at the older son 
Okay? The older son, when he realizes, hey, this my lost brother or whatever, he's come back. Does the older son rejoice? Is he like the father who welcomes him back into open arms? Is he like those other people who, when the lost sheep was found, who, when the lost coin was found, they rejoiced. They had a celebration. They had a party. Was he excited about that? No. We know he wasn't excited. He asked his father, like, Dad, and what he's saying is, you killed the fatted calf for my brother. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to us, but what this older brother is saying is, you gave this younger son the best, the one who has done nothing but shame our name, and you welcomed him back. And the father says, it was right. Verse number 32, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This morning I want to encourage all of us as we think about the loss and how God views the loss is to think about this. What Jesus, who Jesus was trying to address in this story, at the end of this story, was those religious leaders. Those people who thought they knew what they were doing, what they thought what they were doing was right. Jesus is telling them, your heart is not in the right place because there are many lost people in the world who are uninformed by culture, by politics, by other religion, by who knows what. And instead of trying to come to them and to teach them and to welcome them, you have elevated yourselves above them to the point where you are the one who doesn't care anymore. You're not even saddened by their sin. And at the very least, maybe you're just self-righteous. You're not even angry at the sin that they are participating in. You just want to be separate than them. Jesus is telling us what he is welcoming, welcoming and inviting us to do is we need to be people who are seeking the lost because our God is the one who is a seeking God. He is the one who wants people to be found. Now, I want to leave you with one other passage to think about, and it comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And before we read about that passage, I want to address um, some of the other things we talked about earlier, which is, like Adrian, like we read about those Old Testament passages, and like God, we know God doesn't, uh, we know God cares. I think we've established that pretty well. Uh, he wants to bless people, He wants to bless Christians who obey Him, who know Him. That makes sense to us. But how is it that God is sad and how He is angry? Like, what's that really all about? Well, if you look in Numbers, and again, this Old Testament, we could spend all day talking about this. God tells the people of Israel, hey, wipe these people out. But if you read, if you go to Numbers chapter 21 and verses 4 through 9, do you, does anyone remember the story of like the fiery serpents? Like what happens basically in a nutshell in this story is like the people of Israel, we know them. They're the grumbling people. They're the people who complain over and over and over again to God. And God says, I've had enough of that. So what does God do? God sends fiery serpents down from heaven among his people and they start dying. Now, like that's pretty that's pretty brutal, right? Like that if I hope when I if when I mess up later in the day when I sin, that God doesn't send a fiery serpent after me. Like that would be pretty terrifying, right? But that's what God did in his story. God is a righteous God. God is a just God. God cannot stand sin. Period. He cannot stand sin. God does not overlook sin. He has to deal with sin. And it goes against God's nature. But I hope the point that we've been able to understand is God longs to welcome sinners who want to accept Him, who want to obey Him, and who want to become His child. Paul is the one who sums this up for us best, I believe, in Philippians chapter 3, and beginning in verse number 8. And talking about his Christian faith and talking about his Christian walk, about what he is trying to do. He's, and he is one who came out of this Judaism. He was one of those who was a Pharisee, right? People that Jesus was talking to in 15. He had done that. He'd been there. He was very zealous about that. But what does he say? I count everything. Everything, Paul? Everything as loss 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This morning, why is it important that we talk about the lost? Why is it important that we consider how God views them and how really that he views us? Because we were all lost at some point. The reason is, it is a matter of life and death. Paul is saying, I had everything as a Jew. I was able to be that Pharisee of Pharisees. I was the one who people, when they saw me, like, man, I wish I could just be like that Paul guy. Great Jew. He persecuted the even Christians. Like, very zealous guy. I want to be just like Paul. Paul says, until I knew, until I understood that Christ and his righteousness and his mercy and his grace, until I understood that, until I became a faithful follower of him, everything else was worthless. And that's how he considered it. And why does what he end with? The goal is the resurrection from the dead, to be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that, he says, depends upon faith. So this morning, I want to ask you, are you one who is lost? Maybe this morning you have never obeyed Christ in anything that you've done. And maybe you've not understood really who God was. Maybe this morning before you came here, you are like, man, maybe, there's, maybe there is a God, but maybe he really doesn't care about me. And maybe if he does, he just wants me to be happy. If that's how you came in this morning, like, know that we want to study with you. We want to help you understand who God is better. And so we all have a greater understanding of that because we have studied his word. We have been in his word. We want, we want to help you see the God that is in the Bible this morning. So if that describes who you are, uh, we would be happy to do that if you will let us know about that. But maybe either you are not a Christian or maybe you are a Christian and you thought about, man, maybe God is just sad and maybe he's just angry at me every time that I sin. And I want to tell you this morning, it grieves God to his heart when we sin, when we stumble, when we turn our back on him. But know this morning that God is waiting. He's waiting to look, to see you, and to run to you, and to give you the grace and forgiveness that you need to be washed in his son's blood. Because everything, everything that Jesus did on the cross and by raising him from the dead was so that you could be saved, so that you could be saved from the wrath and from God choosing to take out vengeance upon sin. Jesus wants to save you from that. He wants to give you that opportunity. And hopefully, um, you will be able to accept that. You can accept his mercy. But this morning, also, though, I want to ask you as a Christian, to ask me as a Christian, am I lost? this morning. And you may say, Adrian, like, we're here. Like, we are here to worship God this morning. Like, I also came to Bible study, and I am on fire for God. Like, I'm trying to love Him and serve Him as best as I can. And if that describes you this morning, I'm proud of you. I'm glad that you have passion and energy for God, and hopefully you are seeking the lost, and you are doing everything you can to show God to the world. But this morning, if you're struggling, if and you need encouragement, we'd be happy to help you, to pray for you about that. There is no shame in asking for that encouragement, that strength from your fellow brothers and sisters. But this morning, if you've done introspection, if you've thought about your life, and you say, Adrian, like, I need to God to help me change my heart towards those people who are lost, because I realize that, man, I've been like those Pharisees, and I've been a little bit self-righteous, and I just need to turn from that. We'd be glad to help you and pray for you about that as well. If there's anything else that's keeping you, 
But what I want to close with, what I want to encourage us all with, is thinking about, again, how God views the lost. Remember, in our passage, God has, God and the host of heaven has more joy over one sinner who repents than over 99 people who are righteous. It's not to say God doesn't care about the righteous, but God is waiting. He is longing for you to run to him, to accept him, to accept his grace and his mercy this morning. And if you need to do that and respond to the gospel in any way, we welcome you as we stand and sing together.